Good evening and welcome to Gravitas. I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay. Let's get started. Gravitas, co-presented by SBI Mutual Fund, a partner for life. Chemistry that matters. Sabik. Co-powered by Star Health Insurance, the health insurance specialist. Driven by Kia Sonnet. Wild by design. this conflict they have to withdraw tomorrow they will start bullying Europe because they will control the energy pipelines the world is staring at the prospect of another war two former Soviet republics Armenia and Azerbaijan are at loggerheads. Tonight we bring you an exclusive interview with the president of Armenia. He blames Turkey for what's happening. He says Turkey has sent fighter jets and mercenaries to Azerbaijan. He calls it a case of ethnic cleansing and an attempt by President Erdogan of Turkey to control crucial oil and gas supplies. The kind of control that can make him hold Europe hostage. Backing Armenia in this clash are France and Russia. Both are calling for talks. At the moment, the warring sides do not appear very keen on dialogue. Drones are being drowned. Down, rather. More than 100 people, civilian and military, have been killed. If this conflict escalates, it could turn into yet another proxy war between Russia and Turkey. Where is this heading? Is there an appetite for talks? Is the world too distracted to pay attention? 
We'll discuss all this and more with the man who's in the thick of the action, the president of Armenia. Also on the show, Donald Trump has tested positive for the Wuhan virus. His team says he'll remain in action. Joe Biden, who shared a stage with him a few days back, will take a test tomorrow. Pakistan's political battle intensifies. Nawaz Sharif's assets seized. Prime Minister Imran Khan says he's playing India's game sitting in London. Anti-China protests flare up in Mongolia as U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo visits the region. And Subway bread is not bread. That's according to an Irish court. It contains too much sugar. What does it mean for your healthy sub? We'll tell you. But we begin as always with Gravitas Global Headlines. The European Union could impose sanctions on Turkey if it persists in drilling for gas in Cypriot waters. In case of such renewed actions by Ankara, the EU, EU will use all its instruments and options available. We have a toolbox that we can apply immediately. EU Chief Ursula von der Leyen says that EU will use all its instruments and options available should Turkey continue its energy expeditions in the eastern Mediterranean. President Emmanuel Macron terms Islam as a religion that is in crisis all over the world today. Adds this crisis is due to an extreme hardening of positions. Macron says the French government will present a draft law aimed at strengthening secularism in France against Islamic separatism. A Cornell University study reveals that U.S. President Donald Trump has been the world's biggest driver of COVID-19 misinformation during the pandemic. The study identifies over 38 million news articles that amplified misinformation related to the coronavirus pandemic. Chinese influencer dies after being set on fire by ex-husband during a live stream. 30-year-old suffers burns on 90% of her body and succumbs to injuries two weeks after the attack. United States Transportation Department fines Emirates Airlines $400,000 for flights through the Iran airspace last year at a time of heightened tension between the US and Iran. California authorities share video of the intense glass fires currently tearing through Napa and Sonoma counties in the northern part of the state. The Alameda County Fire Department has been working for the last 72 hours to save homes, wineries and vineyards. Data from space research agency INPE shows that fires in Brazil's Amazon increased 13% in the first nine months of the year compared with a year ago, as the rainforest region experiences its worst rash of blazes in a decade. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un tours flood-hit areas to assess recovery efforts while his sister appears for the first time in public in nearly two months. Women's top seed Simona Halep has stormed into the last 16 of the French Open with a thrashing of 25th seed Amanda Anisimova. The American had completed a major upset last year to end Halep's Roland Garris title defense in the quarterfinals, but the world number two extracted a brutal revenge on the 19-year-old, completing a 6-love, six 6-1 six victory in just 54 minutes. She will now face Poland's Iga Swiatek in the fourth round. Over in the men's draw, reigning US champion Dominic Thiem overcame a potentially tricky challenge against 28th seed Casper Ruud with a 6-4-6-3-6-1 win. Arsenal beat Premier League champions Liverpool in a penalty shootout to enter the quarterfinals of the EFL Cup, despite making nine changes to the team that beat Arsenal 3-1 in the league over the weekend. The Reds dominated large parts of the match but were repeatedly thwarted by Bernalino in the Arsenal goal. The German shotstopper was the star of the penalty shootout as well, after things ended goalless in the 90 minutes. Lino saved two spot kicks, allowing Joe Willock to slot home the winning effort. Arsenal will now face holders Manchester City in the quarterfinals.
A hundred year conflict may escalate into a full blown war. Fighter jets are flying, drones are being downed, scores of people, including civilians, have been killed. Countries like Turkey, Russia, and France have picked sides. Armenia and Azerbaijan are on the brink of war. Threatening to disrupt the supply of oil and gas to Europe. Armenia and Azerbaijan were both part of the erstwhile Soviet Republic, USSR. Now they're neighbors. They've been fighting over a region called Nagorno-Karabakh. Azerbaijan is Muslim majority. Armenia has more Christians. The disputed region has ethnic Armenians, but it's seen as part of Azerbaijan. Almost a week ago, the hostilities escalated. More than 100 people have died, as I said, including civilian and military casualties. Just look at the pictures we've received in the last six days. A hail of shelling by Azerbaijan. They have been attacking Armenian positions. These pictures were released on the 30th of September. They show Azerbaijan's army firing artillery shells. Missiles are being, are taking down drones, in fact. This happened yesterday. Reports say these pictures were captured in the Ag Agdam area, inside the conflict zone. An Armenian drone was shot down. A civilian had a narrow escape. A shell narrowly missed a driver. This footage was captured by a CCTV at an unidentified location. All of these images should give you an idea of how serious the situation is. The risk of a major conflict at the crossroads of Asia and Europe. Today, Armenian President Dr. Armin Sarkisin told Vion that Turkey is the creator of this conflict. And before we bring you that exclusive interview, here's a quick primer about this conflict. Nagorno-Karabakh, a region with an area that is roughly four times the size of New Delhi. Look at the map carefully. You would see that Nagorno-Karabakh falls in Azerbaijan, but Armenia takes claim over it. And it's exactly what the dispute is about. This region has been part of Azerbaijan's territory since the Soviet era. And that's how the world recognizes it, even today. But this region has been under de facto Armenian control since the early 1990s. The territory itself declared independence from Azerbaijan way back in 1991. Armenia supported the region both politically and militarily. But it has not recognized Nagorno-Karabakh as independent. Like I told you, Azerbaijan and Armenia have fought over this region for nearly a century now. The violence lasted till the 1990s. Between 1991 and 94, 30,000 people died in the fighting. In 1994, Russia brokered a ceasefire. In the years that followed, it was violated. There were sporadic exchanges of fire. But this one is a very serious flare-up. It began on the 27th of September. Both countries have proclaimed martial law now. Reports say it began when Azerbaijan tried to reclaim some territories that are in Armenian hands. The fighting has not stopped, and both sides have refused to hold a dialogue to end the hostilities. So you may ask this question, why should the world care about this? I have two reasons. One, Nagorno-Karabakh could become a proxy battle for Russia and Turkey. And two, this conflict could disrupt crucial oil and gas supplies. First, let me tell you about Russia and Turkey. This conflict is getting attention worldwide because of their involvement. The Russians back Armenia, Turkey is supporting Azerbaijan. In fact, Turkey is doing more than that. It is adding fuel to the fire. While all major players are calling for peace, President Erdogan of Turkey is raising the specter of war. He calls the Armenians invaders. And if Azerbaijan wants to fight, Erdogan is ready to support them. As a matter of fact, the clashes that began with the attacks on Azerbaijan by Armenians who occupy Nagorno-Karabakh is a concrete example of this. Once again, I would like to reiterate from here that we stand by our Azeri brothers in their fight to liberate their occupied lands and protect their homeland. Russia and Turkey find themselves on opposite sides once again. Already, they back rival camps in Syria and Libya, two countries that are in the midst of a civil war. The fighting in Nagorno-Karabakh could also hit the regional oil and gas supplies. Two key gas pipelines pass through this conflict zone. The Baku-Tbilisi-Seyan crude pipeline is Azerbaijan's main oil artillery to, artillery rather, to world markets. 
the South Caucasus gas pipeline supplies to Turkey and European countries. If this fighting continues, there could be disruptions. The conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan is often referred to as the frozen conflict. What we're witnessing now is the worst fighting in decades. Global concerns are mounting. The risk of a full-blown war now looks real. So it's time for our Gravitas exclusive. The fighting entered its sixth day today as Turkish television was airing footage of an Armenian drone being shot down. Armenia's president, Armin Sarkisian, sat down for an interview with Vion. In a clear message to the international community, President Sarkisian blamed Turkey for triggering this conflict. He said Turkey joined the war to bully and hold Europe hostage. Here's an excerpt from that conversation. President Sarkisian, I interviewed you in Armenia in Yerevan in 2018. It's very good to have you back on Vion, sir. So uh, it's very good to, to see and hear you. And I'm looking forward for our discussion. Yes, uh, it's been almost a week. The hostilities are not ending. Are Armenia and Azerbaijan heading for an all-out war, according to you? This time, it's not only the state of Azerbaijan against the people of Nagorno-Karabakh with an aim to do a ethnic cleansing, but this time Turkey has joined the war. And sure, Turkey has joined the war by bringing with, uh, into within uh, Azerbaijan uh, their officers, their generals, their equipment, their drones, and even F-16 uh, jet fighters. So the aim of this uh, is ethnic cleansing, clean up the Nagorno-Karabakh from Armenians, no matter that these people were living there for thousands of year, years, no matter that there is a way to settle these through negotiations, and as I said, Turkey is fully involved. So Turkey is all involved now, not only in Libya, not only in Syria, not only in Mediterranean, now here as well. The Turkish president has called Armenia the real uh, threat to regional peace. How? Can, you, can, can anybody explain to me? He can call Armenia, I mean, the superpower. Does that make Armenia a superpower? How Armenia is a threat? If he can explain logically where, where is the threat to the region, where Armenia doesn't have any problem with anyone in the region, because it has perfect relations with our, our neighbor Georgia, excellent relations with Russia, very good relations with Iran, the only state that we don't have relations is Turkey, because Turkey doesn't even want to talk or, or recognize the genocide that happened 105 years ago. And the only problem that is there is the Nagorno-Karabakh, a small enclave of Armenians. But the Azeri side and the Turkish side that decided they want to get rid of it. But they can call, call Armenia a threat. Well, uh, it's not the first time I think President Erdogan is is calling this or that, they call something in Libya, they call something in Iraq, they call something in Syria, they always find a reason to get involved. So I think I, I, I completely deny what, uh, I com not deny, I, I, I don't agree at all what President Erdogan is saying. Right. Armenia is not a threat, but, but Turkey is a threat to the whole region now. Who has planned this? You're saying it's a planned thing. Who has planned this? It is planned by Azerbaijan and Turkey. What's in it for Turkey? What's in it for Turkey? Well, several, uh, several things. Of course, they can uh, they can give this uh, the virtual reasons uh, why they are entering there. But the reality is, uh, uh, the uh, the reality is, I'll give you the reasons why. These are opinion of some, uh, many analysts, uh, reporters, or journalists, or political analysts. First of all, there is it's a uh, first of all is to tell to Azerbaijan you cannot resolve this issue. We, we come there and we help you. We resolve the issue. Secondly, to uh, to give a lesson to Armenians and saying don't even mention what happened 105 years ago because we are not going to to recognize the genocide of Armenians. And if you don't behave well, if you don't behave well, you can see what will happen. So it's showing Armenians their might in order to frighten Armenia, Republic of Armenia. Third, 
I think they are now in Azerbaijan, and I have a question. After, whenever the war will over, will over, over, will they leave Azerbaijan or they will stay? So by staying there, they will have tremendous influence on Azerbaijan. And by saying, oh, there is an Armenian threat, so we have to stay here. In reality, they will control the pipelines, oil and gas pipelines, going from Azerbaijan to the West, to Europe. And it's not only Azeri oil and, and gas, but it's also from Caspian, from Central Asia. So Turkey that didn't have their oil, that didn't have their oil, they were consumers of oil, they were clients to buy oil. Now they are going to buy, be the ones that will control the oil that goes to Europe. And Europe will become a hostage for the, in front of them. So what is the reason why on earth Turkey has gone into conflict with Greece and Cyprus? Why on earth they have a, what is their interest, what is their reason being in Libya? And so on. So I think the, the Armenia is, is, is not fighting anywhere, any of these countries. But Turkey, Turkey is, is doing it. So Turkey, for Turkey indeed, this is also energy, this is control of Azerbaijan. It is also basically tomorrow they will start bullying Europe because they will control the energy pipelines and so on and so forth. So there is absolutely clear geopolitical gain that Turkey will have with this war. Azerbaijan's president, Ilham Aliyev, has said that his military would keep fighting until Armenian troops withdraw fully from Karabakh. Now, Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan has also spoken, and, he, and I'm quoting from what he said. He said, it's not very appropriate to speak of negotiations at a time when intensive hostilities are on. To me, it sounds like a classic stalemate. Are both sides even interested in a resolution, sir? Well, what uh, President Ali have said is called classical, classical ethnic cleansing. So we'll not stop until we'll kill every, every Armenian in that territory. It's called ethnic cleansing, cleaning up territory from people that lived there for thousands of years. That's clear for me. What our Prime Minister, my Prime Minister is saying, basically when people, there are people dying there, we have to do in this specific case two or three steps first. Step one. Turkey has to withdraw. They are not a party of this conflict. They have to withdraw from this conflict. Because imagine if Turkey is involved, then third party, fourth party, the regional powers will start involving. We will get a mess. We'll get something which will be 10 times worse than, than Syria. So the solution is pretty clear. Turkey has, has to withdraw. The French president, Emmanuel Macron, uh, seems to be backing Armenia. Uh, Russia has said that it is willing to host the foreign ministers of both sides. Uh, how hopeful are you with these efforts being made to resolve the conflict? Well, I'm uh, always hopeful. If I would not be hopeful, why I'm sitting here as president, I'm, I'm hopeful and I am uh, the one that is... Uh, I want to work for, for the ceasefire. I want to work very hard speaking to everybody. Well, I don't think that President Macron is supporting Armenia. The President Macron what, is uh, supporting the reality, and the reality is Turkey doesn't have anything to do in this conflict. Uh, I respect President Putin's offer and, and Russia's offer. I think the Armenian side uh, of Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia will always be ready if there will be further steps, and the Azeri side will be saying we will be ready for negotiations. I think we were a part of negotiations. We never denied that we don't uh, like the negotiations or, uh, or were unhappy with negotiations. We, did not, we didn't deny negotiations. In fact, we were hoping uh, that uh, in a new format, these negotiations would continue. Negotiations are run uh, from, my, uh, from Armenian side, uh, the prime minister of my government and the foreign minister from Azeri side is their foreign minister and, uh, and the president. So the, any the negotiation on this complicated subject is always complex. Maybe you are happy with negotiations, maybe you are not happy, maybe you are happy with the negotiators. It takes time. And you have to be honestly believing that your solution could be found through dialogue. Because dialogue is not negotiations, it's not only negotiations, it's building up trust. But the moment you break it, start a war, I think that trust goes back to 30 years back. 
You've also urged the international community to intervene, and you just told us that this could be worse than Syria if uh, if there is no timely intervention. But is the world giving this conflict its due attention? Because there are too many distractions. America is busy with an election. Turkey and Russia have too much on their plate, as you've also mentioned. Europe has Brexit and the Eastern Mediterranean tension. So who is going to intervene? Well, exactly. I think that uh, your, your uh, logical sentence would absolutely beautiful, except the fact that you are saying that Turkey is busy. Turkey is the creator of this conflict. So if you take out Turkey from your logical sentence, yes, indeed, the United States has, uh, is going through presidential elections, so it will be very difficult to have their attention. Yes, indeed, Russia has its own problems, be that in, in Ukraine or with Belarus or maybe others. Yes, indeed, uh, uh, everybody is suffering from COVID. Yes, indeed, Europe is, is very busy with the UK's departure, which is uh, creating you know, more questions rather than solutions, and so on and so forth. And plus the COVID, and plus the economic difficulties of everybody. That is why this moment was chosen by Turkey and Azerbaijan to attack. Because they know that the international community is so busy, so they, they can do whatever they like. They can behave like, uh, like I don't know. They can bring terrorists to the, to, to a terrorist and uh, jihadists into this uh, picture. They can bring their army from Turkey. And then the international community will try to intervene. But as you said, because everybody is busy, the, the needed pressure will not be enough. That was their calculation. There's only one thing that they didn't calculate, that people of Nagorno-Karabakh have been fighting for the thousands of years for, for, for themselves. So they are not going to give up. President Sarkisin, thank you very much for being with us on Beyond. Thank you very much. It was nice to hear your voice. U.S. President Donald Trump has tested positive for the Wuhan virus. The man who downplayed the threat of the virus, the man who refused to wear a mask, called the disease just another flu, is now infected with the very same virus. Donald Trump is in self-quarantine 31 days before the U.S. presidential election, which raises many questions. What happens to his re-election bid? What happens to his current presidential term? What happens if Trump is incapacitated, and we hope he isn't? If Aini had a political definition, it would be this. Donald Trump testing positive for the Wuhan virus. It reminds me of the TikTok blogger who tested positive after challenging the virus by licking a commode. That happened, yes. Or the priest who tested positive for the Wuhan virus after calling it God's punishment for homosexuality. Most unfortunate. Anyway, back to the latest from the White House. Reactions have poured in from across the world, as have questions. Who takes over if President Trump is incapacitated? What about Joe Biden? Didn't Trump share a stage with Biden just a couple of days ago? Is he at risk too? We'll try and answer all of these questions in the next five minutes. We'll begin with a tweet, the tweet. This is Donald Trump confirming to the world that he and the First Lady, Melania Trump, have tested positive for the Wuhan virus and that they will be in quarantine. How did Trump get infected? One of Trump's senior advisors tested positive. Her name is Hope Hicks. She is one of the president's close aides and travels with him regularly. Hicks had accompanied Trump to Cleveland for the presidential debate. She was also seen with Trump and other White House officials earlier this week. None of them had masks on. No surprises there. Trump confirmed the news of Hicks being infected just two hours before he tweeted about his own test results. So what happens next? Trump is currently under self-quarantine. The president's physician, Sean P. Conley, has issued a statement. He says, and I quote, The president and the first lady are both well at this time and they plan to remain at home within the White House during their convalescence. Conley has also said, that Trump will, quote-unquote, continue carrying out his duties without disruption while recovering. Trump is 74 years old. Experts say his age and obesity puts him in the high-risk category, which means there are chances that Trump could show serious symptoms of the Wuhan virus. So what's his status right now? 
Is Trump showing any symptoms yet? The White House has said that Trump has mild symptoms. I do not want to sound ominous, but there is a very relevant question that we cannot afford to ignore. What happens if Trump becomes seriously ill? The president has the power to invoke Section 3 of the 25th Amendment. In other words, temporarily transfer his power to the vice president, which means Mike Pence becomes the acting president of the United States. Such transfer of power is not new. President Ronald Reagan transferred his power to his deputy in 1985. George W. Bush did it twice in 2002 and 2007. All of these were for medical reasons. So Trump would not be the first U.S. president in history to transfer his power to the vice president in case the need arises. We were told earlier this evening that Pence has tested negative for the Wuhan virus. This is despite coming in contact with Trump recently, which is good news for Donald Trump. I'll tell you why. Because in case Mike Pence, too had tested positive and were to be incapacitated, then the White House, uh, then the Speaker, the House Speaker, would be the next in line of succession. Nancy Pelosi would have become the acting U.S. President in the run-up to the presidential election. Donald Trump has been saved from this horror, at least for now. But there's another scary question staring him in the face. What happens to his re-election uh, bid, his rallies? What happens to the presidential debates? The next one is scheduled 14 days from now. There has been no word on what Trump's election calendar looks like. We shouldn't be surprised if the upcoming debates are cancelled. Meanwhile, reports say that Joe Biden will be taking a test later today. We cannot forget that he recently shared a stage with Donald Trump. Could things have gotten any messier right before the election? In all of Trump's bizarre statements, estimates and contradictions, did he ever consider that he may test positive for the Wuhan virus just 31 days before the presidential election? Take a look at some of the statements that he made in the past few months. The virus, they're working hard. Looks like by April, you know, in theory, when it gets a little warmer, it miraculously goes away. It's going to disappear. One day, it's like a miracle. It will disappear. I would like you to speak to the medical doctors to see if there's any way that you can apply light and heat to cure, you know, if you could. And maybe you can, maybe you can't. Again, I say maybe you can, maybe you can't. I'm not a doctor, but I'm like a person that has a good, you know what. Uh, sir, you're the president. Deborah, have you ever heard of that, uh, the uh, heat and the light relative to certain viruses? Yes, but relative to this virus. And then I see the disinfectant where it knocks it out in a minute. One minute, and is there a way we can do something like that uh, by injection inside or, or almost a cleaning? Because you see it gets on the lungs and it does a tremendous number of the lungs. And a lot of good things have come out about the hydroxy. A lot of good things have come out. I happen to be taking it. I happen to be taking it. The issue of what happens when you are in France continues to be a school. You're going to have to take that off, please. Just, you can take I'll, it off. Your, your health, how many feet are you away? I'll speak a lot louder. Well, if you don't take it off, you're very muffled. So if you would take it off, it would be a lot easier. I'll, I'll just speak a lot louder. Is that better? It's better, yeah. It's a disease, without question, has more names than any disease in history. <laughs> I can name Kung Flu. I can name 19 different versions of names. Well, the U.S. president is not the only COVID denier who ended up testing positive for the Wuhan virus. There are two other world leaders. The Trump of the tropics, Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro and British Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Our next report tells you how the horror unfolded for them. But when I mentioned the flu, I said, actually, I, I asked the various doctors, I said, is this just like flu? U.S. President Donald Trump called the Wuhan virus a flu. The Trump of because topics called it a flu. little cold. And this is very unusual. He also I called it a hysteria and a fantasy. Every one of these doctors said, how do you know so much about this? Meet Brazil's President Jair Bolsonaro, the poster boy of COVID deniers. He's tested positive for the Wuhan virus not once, not twice, but thrice. 
If you ask him, the chances are that Bolsonaro still believes that the Wuhan virus does not deserve to be taken seriously. Bolsonaro has flouted every possible social distancing norm. He appeared in public without a mask, with a runny nose and a fit of coughing. Shook hands with people, encouraged Brazilians to go out and flout lockdown restrictions. Bolsonaro even tweeted videos of himself visiting shops. The president told his people that nothing would happen to him because apparently he was an athlete in his youth. When death tolls started increasing in Brazil, Bolsonaro said the data was rigged. Soon he claimed that 70% of Brazil's population would be infected. It is the destiny of all human beings to die, he said. In the middle of the pandemic, Bolsonaro flew down to the US to dine with Trump. They met at Mar-a-Lago, spoke about Venezuela, probably shared a joke or two about the flu and the little cold that the world was overplaying. Cut to July 2020, Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro caught the little cold. He tested positive for COVID-19 and became the latest member to join the club of COVID deniers who contracted the virus. Its first member was British Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Fresh out of elections and extremely sloppy in his response to the Wuhan virus, Johnson held a press conference at the beginning of the pandemic. He told Britons that he visited Wuhan virus patients in a hospital and that they should be, quote unquote, pleased to know that the virus did not stop him from shaking the hands of the patients. As the virus spread, the Prime Minister embarked on a holiday with his then pregnant fiancée. In March, he told his countrymen to allow the disease, as it were, to move through the population. This was Bojo's plan to create herd immunity. Hi folks, I want to... Cut to the 27th of March, 2020. Beware of walking down this path. The coronavirus, that's to say a temperature and a, a persistent cough, and on the advice... Bureau report, we are. So World is one. Taken a test that has come out positive, so I am working from home, I'm self-isolating. Political comebacks can be tricky, especially if you're in the opposition and the government is out to get you. We're talking about Pakistan's former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif. Since his return to politics, the Pakistan government has targeted him relentlessly. An anti-corruption court has ordered a major crackdown on the former PM. His bank accounts have been frozen, close to 220 acres of land, and even his house and vehicles have been seized. The crackdown is linked to the Tosha Khana graft case. Nawaz Sharif is being accused of obtaining luxury cars at throwaway prices. Another former Prime Minister, Yusuf Raza Gilani, has also been implicated. He's being accused of tweaking the rules so that political leaders could go on a luxury car buying spree. Now, these charges may all hold merit. But let's focus for a moment on the question of who is being accused rather than what the accusations are. These investigations and court cases are all part of Imran Khan's grand anti-corruption drive. Legal action has been taken against some high-profile names like Nawaz Sharif, Asif Ali Zardari, Shehbaz Sharif and Yusuf Raza Gilani. Now notice all of these leaders belong to the opposition in Pakistan and this is precisely the accusation against Imran Khan's government. The anti-corruption campaign has been politicized. It has become a tool for vendetta. It is being used to target the Prime Minister's opponent. In August, the Human Rights Watch highlighted the very same issue. It urged the government of Pakistan to stop abuses by the top anti-graft body, the National Accountability Bureau. Even the Supreme Court criticized the Bureau for its lack of professionalism and sincerity. The timing of this campaign against the opposition, this renewed campaign, is also suspect. 
Parties opposed to Imran Khan have combined forces in Pakistan. They're calling for the Prime Minister's resignation. Nawaz Sharif addressed this multi-party forum twice from London. He was critical of the role played by the Pakistan army in propping up Imran Khan. The Prime Minister has latched on to this and he is accusing Nawaz Sharif of playing what he calls India's game. That's what he said. Imran Khan said, and I'm quoting, Sharif has gone to the United Kingdom and is playing India's game. He is attacking Pakistan sitting over there. He is 100% getting backing from India. Now, it's understandable why Imran Khan is keen on making this an India versus Pakistan issue. By painting Sharif and the opposition as puppets of New Delhi, Imran Khan will be able to ensure the military support. So legal action is the government's first strategy. The second one is to censor the media, prevent them from broadcasting what opposition leaders are saying. Pakistan's Electronic Media Regulatory Authority, or PEMRA, has asked news channels to not broadcast speeches made by convicts. The order is being seen as aimed at muzzling Nawaz Sharif. It was published merely hours after Sharif spoke at the Pakistan Muslim League's Working Committee meeting. The PEMRA order cites a 2019 rule, a rule that prevents channels from giving a platform to convicts and absconders. But the government of Pakistan, we must tell you, was not always this eager to deny a platform to convicts. Take former dictator Parvez Musharraf, for instance. His audio clips were widely broadcast by the Pakistani media, but the government never objected. Why is it doing now? Because Imran Khan seems rattled by the opposition's unity. His strategy is to ensure that Nawaz Sharif's political comeback does not get any traction in Pakistan. It was literally a crowning moment inside a courtroom in Brussels. After fighting a bitter legal battle for seven years, a Belgian artist, Delphine Bowl, was recognized as a princess, as the daughter of Belgium's former king. Our next report traces her decades-long journey for justice. A decades-long controversy has been put to rest in Belgium. Delphine Bowl, once the secret daughter of Belgium's former king, is now a princess. After a seven-year-long trial, a court in Brussels has ruled in her favour. It confirmed that King Albert II is indeed her biological father. Her lawyers say a judicial victory will never replace a father's love. But it does offer a sense of justice. It was in 1999 that the existence of a secret daughter first came to light. Delphine Pohl was born out of an affair between the ex-king and a Belgian baroness. She's lived in London since the age of eight, embracing art as an escape from the controversies surrounding her life. In 2013, King Albert II abdicated his throne soon after Delphine Pohl filed a paternity suit against him. But throughout the trial, the ex-king denied his paternity. In August, Delphine Bowl hosted an exhibition. Most of her works drew on the pain of a long and drawn out court battle. See you again. This is another poem. It's about shame, um, how I felt shameful of just my existence. Uh, just to remind you that I didn't become famous because of, uh, of, of my artistic talent. It was because I was the dirty laundry of, of uh, Albert II. And um, so it was kind of a, a shameful... It was the threat of hefty fines that finally changed the former king's heart. In January, he acknowledged his paternity after a DNA test came back positive. But the court battle continued. Delphine Pohl wanted to be recognized as a princess, as part of the Belgian royal family. The court has endorsed her demands. Delphine Pohl will henceforth be known as Her Royal Highness Delphine de Saxe-Coburg. Her children will be treated as Belgian princes and princesses. Despite the controversies that surrounded her life and the constant denials from the royal family, Delphine Bowl remains a committed monarchist, a staunch supporter of the institution that failed her for so long.
ब्यूरो रिपोर्ट वी ऑन वर्ल्ड इज वन It may be election season in America but the US State Department is working overtime on other things. Donald Trump may or may not win the election but his Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has not given up on his mission to isolate China on the global stage. Mongolians now want China punished too. So ahead of Mike Pompeo's visit they've launched a campaign. The US Secretary of State is scheduled to travel to Asia on Sunday. A stop in Mongolia is on the schedule. Ahead of Pompeo's visit, Mongolians campaigned against China in Ulaanbaatar, which is the capital of Mongolia, a country that neighbors the Chinese province of Inner Mongolia. For weeks now, Inner Mongolia has witnessed protests and school boycotts. That's because China is forcing the Mandarin language on Mongolians. Now they accuse China of human rights violations and they say Beijing is trying to eradicate ethnic cultures. Mongolians blame their own government for muzzling criticism against Beijing. The protesters want Mike Pompeo to stand by them. By messing with the children of Genghis Khan, they have marked the beginning of their end. Still, they're trying to make people forget and ease this issue, but it will never be forgotten. It's not going to happen. The Chinese government has stated nothing has gone wrong, and there is nothing wrong with learning Chinese. So I say to them. as written here on my sign if there is nothing wrong to switch to different language then china should adopt mongolian in their classrooms then mongolians will not allow the switch to a different language strong voices here is what they worried about in recent years china has adopted a policy of forced assimilation in minority regions like xinjiang and tibet china has reopened has opened rather reeducation camps It has tried to erase the ethnic identity of these minorities and forced minorities to show loyalty to the communist party. Last week we told you how China is forcing Tibetans into forced labor. China is extending its ethnic assimilation policies to Inner Mongolia too. It has forcibly introduced the Mandarin language in schools. When parents protested, the government went after them. Hundreds of parents who refused to send their children to school were punished in China. They were detained by the police. Some were even slapped with a fine of 5000 yuan that's around $733. It did not end there. Parents were sent to legal education classes. The kind of camps that China set up for Uyghur Muslims. The United States is China's biggest adversary and that's the reason why Mongolians want support of Mike Pompeo. He was supposed to visit Japan, South Korea and Mongolia, but after Donald Trump tested positive, Pompeo may be rethinking his plans. Meanwhile, his State Department has weighed in on another matter. The US has opposed China's attempts to advance its territorial claims in Arunachal Pradesh. The US State Department issued the statement and I'm quoting, for nearly 6 decades the US has recognized that Arunachal Pradesh is Indian territory. We strongly oppose any unilateral attempts to advance territorial claims. by incursions by military or civilian incursions across the established LAC it doesn't matter who becomes the next president of america as far as china is concerned america views the communist party as a threat and washington dc will keep pressing beijing hard on its military aggression and human rights violations nasa meanwhile is planning some plumbing upgrades for the International Space Station. It has unveiled a new toilet for astronauts. At 23 million dollars, it is the most expensive loo made ever. In addition to mechanical upgrades, the new system is being touted as more female friendly. Our next report explains why. The simplest of things often become difficult in zero gravity, especially trips to the toilet. For years, astronauts at the International Space Station have struggled with bulky, inefficient toilets. But NASA has come out with a new model that will hopefully solve this problem: a 23 million dollar titanium toilet. The ISS is currently fitted with clunky Russian-built toilets, but at 45 kilograms and 28 inches, the new ones are just half as big. A few subtle changes have been made to make the new model better suited for women. The seats are more tilted than before and the system as a whole is much taller. The old ones on the other hand are more convenient for men, something many women astronauts have raised in the past. 
We're actually getting a new toilet on board the International Space Station. This new toilet is going to be a little bit easier to use for both men and women. Of course, there are some anatomical differences and some of the earlier versions didn't take into account everything equally kind of for both men and women. So this one should be a little bit easier to use for everybody. The space station will get a lot more crowded in the coming years. SpaceX has already started sending astronauts up, and Boeing is less than a year away from doing the same. It goes without saying, more people means more toilets. The new model will first get a trial run at the space station. If the response is positive, it'll be cleared for regular use. NASA has high hopes for its new design. The United States' upcoming lunar missions are also expected to use the new toilet. The last time NASA ordered new toilets for the space station was in the 1990s. Since then, space programs have come a long way. In terms of technology and diversity of personnel, this $23 million invention is in many ways a reflection of those changes. Viewer report, we own. World is one. On that note, We'll wrap up this edition of Gravitas, leaving you as always with Gravitas Images. Have a good weekend. We'll see you on Monday.